Hey guys, Brian Jodis back for the first Pick Up the Six podcast episode of 2023. Hope you had a great holiday season. I know we did, and man, it's great to be back and be with you. We've got a really cool show coming up with Jeff Vader Brandon. He's an F-16 and F-15 pilot. But before that, let me remind you about my great friends at Allbirds. As always, we've got a special deal for you. If you go to allbirds.com and you use the code Pick Up the Socks, like what you put on your feet, uh, on any order over 50 bucks, you can get a free pair of socks. So you throw some socks into your cart, you use that code pickupthesocks.com with anything you're buying over 50 bucks and those socks, they'll just knock the price right off and you get those for free. I love their shoes. I've got a few different pairs. I've always had those wool sort of casual style sneaker. I just got a brand new pair. It's a little different. It's a sort of a hybrid runner. I'm wearing it as just like a comfort, right? Everyday kind of shoe and I absolutely love it. I've got some of those tree flyers, those bright orange ones, which they're super loud, but also very comfortable. And so just love what they're doing at All Birds. They create great product, uh, sustainable, very comfortable, and they're hooking you guys up. So go to allbirds.com, check out what they've got in uh, stock right now, and use that code Pick Up the Socks at checkout, and you're getting a free pair of socks. Thank you guys at All Birds, and thank you for listening to the show. My guest today is Jeff Vader Brandon. Jeff is an Air Force fighter pilot, having spent time in the cockpit of an F-16 and F-15C, along with other guys in flight suits, Jeff launched the Kodiak Shack podcast, where they're connecting the frontline warfighter with those that innovate. I'm Brian Jodis, and this is Pick Up The Six Podcast. Jeff, what's up, man? Good to have you. Hey, yeah. Thank you for having me, Brian. Let's get right into it. Vader. All right, lay it on me. Every good (laughs) pilot's got a call sign. Right. I'm son to dice, also known as snake eyes in the chief community. We'll connect the dots there in a little yeah. bit. But why? Why the Dark Lord of the Sith? Right. <laughs> why Vader? Yeah. So that one. Uh, so the story behind that, most fighter pilot names uh, have two stories. Okay. Uh, and normally they're supposed to be told over a uh, an adult soda. Sure. I understand we're breaking uh, some protocol. I get it. Yeah. But. <laughs> Uh, so when I was a young guy, uh, I'd like to believe that I have uh, fixed this issue, but I doubt I have. Uh, when I was young, I would key the mic. So in the F-16, you kind of lift up a little radio key, mm-hmm. but I wasn't ready to talk yet. And you so just then I breathing just kinda into it. Breathe in on the radio. <laughs> no one else can talk. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so that's that's what it was. I was uh, I could move my hands faster than I could move my brain. So that that was that's life. So good. That's yeah, so, so good. good. You know, I dude, I'd be honest with you, man. Like. I was so very fortunate and blessed as a kid, you know, my brothers and I would tell you that some of our fondest memories are are legit hanging out in squadron bars and just spending time around those guys. Right. And my dad's my hero and just getting to see those guys in action. But man, all the different nicknames, like they had a guy named two dogs. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, My dad punched out of an F one eleven with a guy named born to die. Like, come on, man. (laughs) Yeah. That's not, it's good stuff. That's, that's a dangerous guy to fly with. That's for sure. No shit. <laughs> I mean, it worked out <laughs> on the good end for them. So that's, that's true. That's good. Man. Where are you from, dude? When did you, uh, when did you decide you wanted to get in the air force and, and fly fighters? Yeah. So I was, uh, so I grew up in California and, uh, much to my parents chagrin, I was a terrible student. So anybody mm. out there who's listening, who thinks you have to be a straight A student to be a fighter pilot, not true. Uh, you stick just with the to, kids though. Stick with it. Exactly. Yeah. You, you <laughs> should be a good student. Just sadly yeah. I was not until sure. I, until I had an initial vector. Uh, so I went, I went to uh, school and kind of just wanted to play sports and do stuff like that. And then my, uh, my grandma's brother, so kind of a roundabout way, but his son, uh, he was a Sergeant major in the army and his son flew F 16s. And so when I was about 16 years old, I, I went uh, with them on a family vacation and he and another fighter pilot, much like Brian, you probably saw when you were growing up, just listen to these guys talk about their life and, you know, what they do and, and dog fighting or what's referred mm-hmm. to as BFM and uh, talking about flying under NVGs at 30,000 feet and looking up and you see more stars than you could ever imagine in the night sky. And I was like, man, that is crazy. I could never do that. And so I, I kind of just, you know, went through high school and then got into college and then his dad, sadly, my, uh, my grandma's brother's son, he passed away, um, in his forties and his dad later when I was in college said, why don't you just go to Fresno state and fly F-16s? And I was like, okay, 
I'll do that. And uh, I always say better to be lucky than good because it wasn't mm. my skills that got me there, but I got lucky. So that's cool. Hey, super shout out uh, to our friend TJ. I'll leave his last name out. Just, I don't know, because it feels like the right thing to do, I suppose. <laughs> uh yeah. but also fighter pilot guy who got us connected which is really that's cool. right i got an email from you like tj said we connect and uh i just i love it man i love the small world thanks for listening right thanks for being a loyal listener and and for connecting us uh we're talking to jeff vader brandon he's a fighter pilot uh also uh host of the kodiak shack podcast and man just talking about innovation over there so all right so you go the fresno state route right um when did you get in right when did you start flying and Dude, what was that experience like when they when they let you jump in that thing and get going? Yeah, it's uh it's a long road. So anybody who thinks you're gonna like join and become a fighter pilot in six to eight months, not gonna work out. Uh, right. but ROTC, I did the abbreviated version because I spent time at a junior college because again, I didn't didn't have my stuff together. Uh, and then I got to Fresno State and did about two years of ROTC or reserve officer training corps. Uh, did that. They prep you to become an officer in the Air Force when you uh, graduate college. Graduated on, uh, I had my ceremony on December 10th. And then I commissioned on January 6th. And I was in Montgomery, Alabama on January 13th. So, uh, what year very was this? quick. Uh, 2011. Nice. So, uh, so 2011, I go to what's called air and space basic course, which doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. It was just a couple of years. Um, I did that. And then I went off to Columbus air force base, which I did some homework. At, That's uh, where I was born. Yep. I was going to yeah. say the general, uh, he was there a long, long right. time ago. Yep. And, um, so yeah, so I ended up going to Columbus. I loved it. I had a great time. Uh, you do what's called IFS or introduction to flight, uh, or initial flight screening. That's what it's called. Um, and what that is, is basic stuff. You're flying at what's called a DA 20. It's a diamond two seater, very small. It's effectively built like a glider, but it has a hmm. little lawnmower motor in it. So you fly that for a couple of weeks. I think I was there for three weeks total. Went back to, uh, went to Montgomery or uh, Max, or not Maxwell, sheesh, Columbus, Mississippi. Uh, and then I started pilot training about two weeks later. So pilot training is roughly um, like 12 months, like 15 months, something like that. Um, so I started in, I believe it was May. And then I finished in uh, June or July. Tell so, everybody about that experience when you go through all that. We've talked to other pilots about it before, and I've seen it firsthand. It's an amazing night where you go through that whole experience and then you finally get that sort of airplane of assignment. What was what was that night like for you? That what what you might remember, I suppose. Yeah, it was uh, it was a wild night, that's for sure. Uh, so you kind of the way it is now, uh, you start out in what's called a T six or a T six Texan two, which is a new variant of an older. Uh, world war world war ii aircraft what's it look um, like uh so it's a single prop uh two seat tandem so think sitting front and back uh and then it's a uh, pilot talk but low wing so the wing uh -huh. is below the pilots uh and then it T38 is 38 uh, ish is uh no so 37 ish so, diff totally different uh different because it's so it doesn't have jet engine so it's got mm. a uh turbo prop so oh, it has cool. effectively a a a jet engine that turns a propeller. So, so you, you can't start do too, out there, you can't do too much damage up there. In it. That's and it's super robust. It's a, right. you know, if I could not that I will ever own an airplane, but if I could own an airplane, it'd be a sweet plane to own because hmm. I mean, you got a couple hours you can fly and, and it's maneuverable and it's just, it's a sweet, sweet airplane. So I really enjoyed flying that even though I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and then you get uh, racked and stacked or you get uh, stratified amongst the rest of your class. And then the people who want to go to T-38s, the fighter bomber track, uh, they will go there. And then the people who want to go the uh, heavy, like the C-17, C-130 uh, track, they will go the T-1 route for now. That's going to change in the coming years. But currently, and when I was going in, uh, that was the case. So I was lucky enough to track T-38s. And then now you strap into a fighter type aircraft. Back to back then, you would wear your parachute out to the airplane uh, because it was that old school of a jet uh, back in the day. But two afterburners, tiny little engines, not a ton of gas, uh, but maneuverable enough. So uh, if anybody's seen the original Top Gun, it's the the MiG twenty eight. Those are the little, bad guys. Those that's are the bad right. Guys. Yeah. So the T. Like, dude, I saw those flying all over the sky when I was a kid. Those yeah. are the good guys. That's right. Exactly. And there, and it's, it's a fun plane to fly. It's uh, 
tiny wings. It mainly flies on thrust alone, uh, which works out when you go to other fighters because the F-16 was similar. But then I went T-38s and the drop night between T-6s and T-38s, it's make or break, you know, because if you don't go T-38s, you never have a chance to go fighters. So that was a big night. That was a lot of uh, a lot of happy people, a few not so happy. Uh, and then when you get to the end of the course, you're racked and stacked once again against your T-38 uh, peers. And then the T-1 people are uh, racked and stacked against each other. Uh, and lucky enough, uh, I just, I just kind of, it worked out. So I was, I was one of the, the number one grad. He's, uh, better than me at pretty much everything. He's, uh, he wants to be an astronaut now, so I don't feel too bad. Uh, yeah. but luckily I was, I was not too far behind. So we both got our first choice, uh, which was F-16. And that was, uh, what they do is they kind of show like a picture and you've probably seen this brand. They'll show like a PowerPoint and the yeah. PowerPoint will have airplanes that all kind of swirl around. And then they'll disappear and then your plane shows up. And so that moment between all the planes kind of swirling and then the blank screen feels like an eternity. And you're like, oh, and then boom, an F-16 shows up and uh, I was going to Luke Air Force Base and I was ecstatic because that was top choice. No question about it. So it was it was a good night. It was a good, uh, good 12 to 15 months of training. Yeah. And well, it's a lot of hard work, man, that goes into it to culminate in that moment and you get some clarity sort of like what the future looks like and where you're going to go. So where do the journeys take you next? I know you got some combat deployments. So tell me a little bit about what happens after that. Yeah. So, so once you graduate pilot training, you have achieved the entry fee to try to fly fighters. So you have achieved nothing yet. Sure. And uh, so, which is, which is kind of uh, cool, but then kind of like disheartening a little at the same time. Cause then the first thing you do, you turn around and you go to IFF. So introduction to fighter fundamentals. So you take airplanes from, this is a means to get from A to B. And then now it says, now you are going to use an airplane as a weapon. Uh, and that's what IFF does. It changes your whole perspective, your entire uh, focus is like, yes, we are going to be safe on the ground to the airspace and getting home. Mm. But the majority of your time, which you're briefing is talking tactics. So you sit down and you will brief for about 60 minutes. Uh, and then eight to 12 minutes will be what is referred to admin going to and from, and then 50 minutes roughly will be spent on tactics and tactics alone. So uh, a lot of work that goes into that. And again, you're kind of starting at the bottom rung. So that's only two months long and it is fast and furious. Very, Super very intense. Intense. Yeah. And it's, and before, and when I was kind of going through it, people referred to it as like a haze or a screening, um, kind of, uh, course. I, I never thought it was, I had a good time. I enjoyed, it was stressful. Everything was stressful. So, you know, you kind of get used to that, but then you do IFF. Luckily I got through, went to Luke air force base. Uh, about 11 months of uh, F-16 training. And then I was off to Japan uh, in Misawa Air Base in Northern Japan for my first assignment to fly what's called the Block 50 F-16. So the Air Force owns uh, different variants of the F-16 and the Block 50 has the most powerful F-16 motor that the Air Force owns. So that didn't, that didn't hurt my feelings. Uh, yeah, hurt my neck no though. kidding. You're zipping yeah. around. You said something yeah. that was interesting. And I mean, you think about this, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody heard anybody say the sentence you just said, and it won't be a big surprise, but you said, train you how to use that airplane as a weapon, yeah. right? And it's one thing to learn how to fly, but it's another to learn how to fly with the intent of into combat to uh, protect, defend, and and to bring the boom, to bring the thunder when you have to. And do you ever, I mean, did you ever sit back and as you're going through the process, think about, first of all, one, that responsibility, and then two, like, Boy, my nation is investing a ton in me, one person. There's a bunch of us, but in yeah. this one guy to kind of get this right every time I go up there. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is, is not to be taken lightly. And I would say specifically flying fighters, one of my uh, old directors of operations. So kind of a number two guy in a, in a fighter squadron, he, his boss told him a long time before. And then he told me, he said uh, that flying fighters and flying in, in particular, but more specifically to fighters is not inherently dangerous, but it's extremely unforgiving. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great way to look at it because like every day you're not going out intending to do something dangerous and you shouldn't be doing something dangerous. 
But when you make mistakes, like, you know, you could get yourself hurt, get yourself killed, or even worse, get someone else killed. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's one of the things that you have to understand. Like there's a massive responsibility when you're doing these things. So, uh, but yeah, you are taught exactly that. The first meeting when I got to IFF, which is again, like when you are a Lieutenant in a fighter squadron, you sweep the floors, you make popcorn, you make coffee, you take out trash because you're the new guy and you shouldn't be mad about that. Like you should be proud that you're the guy who gets to sweep floors in a fighter squadron. You know what I mean? And so uh, that's one of the things that when I got to IFF, they said a zero means you can't do it. So they grade you on a scale of zero or you, which is unable. And then one, two, three, four. And he says a zero means you can't do it. A one means you can barely do it. A two means you can do it adequately. A three means you're as good as me. And a four means you're better than me. So he said, don't expect to get a better than a two. Uh, and that's, yeah. and that's just kind of the world you're in where you're like, the bar is high, you know? And so going on a sortie and being debriefed on a litany of things you did wrong is very, very common. Like I would say it is more surprising to be highlighted for doing a good thing than that out of anything. You know, you spend yeah. a lot of time getting critiqued and you just got to get used to it. Sure. All right. Tell me about, um, man, combat deployment uh, and that experience. My first time, right, with that kind of weight. Yeah. So, I mean, you think, uh, so different people have different experiences when they go to combat. And mine was kind of an interesting one because we were going, my first deployment out of Japan was called a TSP. So uh, I think it's a theater support package is what it's referred to. I'm probably getting the acronym wrong. There's too many. Um, But we were going out there with no intention of actually going to combat. We were just going out to the Middle East to kind of, it's a, it's a posturing tool. It's, Hey, you know, everybody out there just understand there's block 50 F 16s from Japan hanging out. Yeah. And then stuff, uh, unfortunately kicked off in, uh, Iraq while we were there. And so, uh, I've told the story before on, uh, one of the previous podcasts, uh, but I go and I go off base and we're going to have a naming, which, you know, everybody's naming is kind of a big deal. Um, and I pick up a ton of shawarma and it's not for me, but I'm the Lieutenant. So that's what I do. So I get back with like 300 like shawarmas and, uh, they say, you've been in crew rest for two hours. You're going in combat tomorrow mm. morning. And I was like, "Woo! All right, here we go. So, uh, yeah, first night night or first combat sortie. I think we took off at, I want to say three or four in the morning. So, you know, the cover of darkness, like exactly what you would imagine. We kind of cruise into country lights out and, uh, and we don't do anything. We just kind of burn holes in the sky. And, um, and you do all this training, you're like, oh man, I'm going to be so, so capable. I'm going to, I'm going to be the tip of the spear, you know? And then we spent about a month just staring at the ground, you know? And so, uh, so you, you got to kind of, you know, understand that, Hey, there's a big, big machine, getting its wheels turning, uh, that you are a very, very small cog in and you can't, you can't misunderstand that because yeah. that's reality. Well, there's something in there about, you know, continue to be purpose driven. Cause you think like, I mean, you, your mindset is likely like, this is great. I'm going in, let's fuck some shit up. Yeah. And you didn't have to not yeah. called upon to do that. So you still got to be able to focus on, all right, great. What's the mission? What are we here to do? Why are we here to do it? Yeah. And I think the tough part was, it was, it was very clear who were good guys and who are bad guys. It was very clear that the, the opportunity presented itself, but there was no appetite for it initially. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the tough part where you're sitting there and you're loaded to the gills. I mean, you have three live radar guided missiles, one live heat seeking missile, and you have four 500 pound bombs and 510 rounds of 20 millimeter live ammunition. And you're like, okay, like you sent me here for a reason. Like, let me, let me do my job. And then they're like, nope. So we did a lot of what's called NTISR or non-traditional information surveillance and reconnaissance. What that means is you stare at the ground and in an F-16, you're not really going to upgrade. Like you're not going to see much other than hot spots. Mm. you know, like that's a human. I can't tell if it's an adult, if it's a male or a female, but I just know it's some human. So that's the tough part where you're, I'm doing information surveillance and reconnaissance in a platform that was never made to do that. So I'm mm-hmm. not saying I'm not trying to complain, even though fighter pilots are really good at that. Uh, I'm just saying like, 
that's the nature of the beast is, sure. you know, there's some times where you're going to be King Kong slinging all your weapons. And some days you're going to be sitting there and the biggest threat is, you know, peeing on yourself on accident because you missed the piddle pack. So, you know, there's, there's highs and lows in every job. Not like peeing into a Ziploc bag with a sponge in it. Right. That's right. Yeah. See, they've gotten, they've gotten better now. Have they, have they, yeah, that's what I say. Yeah. I'm so dated on my reference points. I don't know. I haven't done shit. Right. Like I, I've just seen it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, was, well, I, I was, thought it was fascinating. Like That's cool. What, and that's, you know, it's funny. Uh, sometimes people ask me questions, you know, and, and people have different varying levels of exposure, understanding and all those things. And I appreciate every question because I'm, I'm lucky to have a job that people want to ask questions about. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'm like, oh, these would be awesome questions to try to dive into. And then people are like, how do you go to the bathroom in the jet? And I'm like, yeah, that's valid too. That's also a good question. Same way, same way the race car drivers do sometimes. Man. That's right. Yeah. Well, and you know, they have tried over the years and this kind of segues, uh, I, we're probably going to get there, uh, in time, but into defense innovation, you mm -hmm. know, you look at a lot of things and you imagine like for anybody who's not in the military and never been in the military, the military grade is not always what you would hope it to be. So right. sometimes- I don't know, man. We've watched a lot of movies where you got a lot of badass stuff at your disposal. That's right. Well, you know, if it's out there, it's not been at my base. But, right. you know, we have, they they refer to it as exquisite technology. And we do. We have F-22 Raptors and we have 35s and we have amazing technology. And then we also plan to fly those aircraft on whiteboards and Excel. Like right. we literally handwrite information and you're like that's got to be a joke you know and we talk to people who are innovators and they're like i can't believe you don't have this and it's like yeah we don't have a lot of things so yeah that's life it sure is well then tell me a little bit about man i mean it's a perfect segue it's as if you were a podcast host and you know how to <laughs> bridge the topic so kudos to you i've well yeah i may no, have met my match today so no, what you wanted to do right you get into this you're around other guys that you respect, you're like, let's, let's talk about, let's, let's put a platform where we can talk about these innovations and ways we can bridge a gap and bring that warfighter, right? Some information on innovation. I think that's the genesis of Kodiak Shack podcast. So just tell us about how it got started, what you guys are trying to do there. Yeah. So I'll, we'll kind of go a little beforehand. So I did, uh, I did about 10 years on the active duty air force and specifically for me, but I would say most fighter pilots, uh, singularly focus. I want to fly jets. Yeah. And I want to hang out with my bros. Like those are the two things we want. And hanging out consists of, you know, some non-flying work, briefing, planning, you know, planning, briefing, flying and debriefing. So, but that's what we want. We want to fly jets and hang out with our bros. And I did that for almost my entire career. I didn't want any other job. I didn't want to do anything else because, I mean, sadly for me, because I probably should have had a better perspective like other people who, who prioritized officership, uh, I did not. You know, I was like, hey, I'm here to fly jets. And I did exactly that. So about 10 months before I separated from the active duty Air Force, they said, uh, hey, Vader, you are going to be our innovation lead. And this was at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, which is the F-16 formal training course. And um, and I was like, OK, I'm terrible at technology, uh, which why wouldn't I create a podcast? You know, I don't sure. know how to use any of this stuff. But, sure. Uh, yeah. So so I end up. uh running innovation. And I realize the things that I complain about on a daily basis, there, if not one company, there's multiple companies working on a solution and they are desperate to let people know about this problems they're trying to solve and to get feedback from end users, much like myself and other people who have on the job experience. And they, I mean, the, the beautiful thing about the innovation space is everybody has just been just totally open, just totally inviting and accepting of some guy who knows nothing about it. I used to fly airplanes or I guess I still do, but, uh, overall they, I just said, teach me, tell me because I, I'm, I'm uninformed, inform me. And they have, and it's been amazing. So what I found was I get mad about the scheduling process, or I get mad about, uh, different currencies we have to keep or different programs or software that are terrible. And it turns out people are desperate to solve that problem for me. And the least I can do is help them. Mm. Uh, and, and that's kind of why we started the podcast. I was actually driving across the New Mexico desert at like 5 AM on my way out to California as I was separating from the military. And, uh, I was listening to a podcast because most people do these days. Uh, and I said, this is what we need. We need a podcast that talks about the things that are out there, the stuff that 
exists or can exist to make life better. So hopefully the next Vader doesn't want to leave because of broken software or broken processes. So that yeah. was kind of the the driving force behind it. Who 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 are you having on it, right? Who are you talking to? What are the conversations like? Yeah, so we luckily we've had an amazing complement of people. So uh so we've had um Crowdbotics which is doing using AI and data analytics to um analyze our flight data. So now what we do, fighter pilots go out, they'll fly from anywhere from 40 minutes to two plus hours and they'll, no fight. They'll either fight within visual range or where they can see each other. So think like top gun type mm-hmm. maneuvering, or longer range where you're 50, hundred miles away and they'll analyze that. And we say, I should be doing this. And then we, they input that into AI and AI says, well, you didn't do it. And you're like, Okay, well, that's where I screwed up. Right now, we just painstakingly look in roughly six to 10 second slices of a 60 to 60 second to 60 minute uh, fight. Yeah. We will just go through every single thing. Did we do it right there? Yes. Did we do it right there? So that's what they're working on. We've got other companies that are working on uh, automated scheduling where AI is going to change scheduling. So a human isn't inputting every single thing. You just use a computer to do that. So we'll talk to companies like that. We'll also talk to military innovators. So we've had um, retired 06s like our friend TJ. uh, And he actually told me he's also working in an innovation uh, company called um, Vertex. And uh, awesome stuff because you look out there and Vertex is building um, VR trainers for not only a single seat fighter pilot, but a crewed aircraft. Mm. And now if you if you don't really think about the complexity there, now think about, Brian, and if, if you and I are trying to work in the same cockpit, shoulder to shoulder, in like a C-130. I was going to say, if you're in a big one, right? If you're in a big heavy, like in a bird, and you've got the ability to legit like maneuver around that through VR, that's amazing. Well, even, that's amazing training. When you think about there's there's so many simple things that, that I didn't even think about, and I think most people don't. I I want to raise the gear in VR with my real hand. Like I don't want to have to hit a fake button that makes the gear mm-hmm. come up, but I can't see my own hand in VR. So now companies right. are coming up with called augmented reality or mixed reality, uh, which is I look out the virtual reality windows through these and it's virtual reality. And then when I'm looking inside the cockpit, it's my real hands. It's just a pass through video camera. And uh, yeah, yeah. So then I can look left and I would look at you Mm -hmm. in real life and then look out the window past you and it's VR and it's like, blow your mind. And what people don't may not realize is specifically for fighter types, the one simulator is multiple millions of dollars. Most training fighter bases have anywhere from four to 12 if we can take those multi-million dollar simulators and instead of having nine projectors to make a full 360 view, because you need that in fighters, it's just on your face. So if you look over your shoulder, you still see what you're supposed to see instead of having a 1980s projector Mm -hmm. project an image. So that's the reality. Like they are changing the game and those things are going to be downstream, you know, in, in the next five years, the next 10 years, it will be a different experience than, you know, what you've heard stories about, what I have experienced, like with the next generation of, of students in fighter pilots are going to, yeah. are going to change, like it's going to change for them. And it has to, because we have older planes and we're not going to be able to train the way we trained when I grew up. That sounds incredible. Do you anticipate as you're bringing disruption into a marketplace like this pushback though? Cause I got to think there's a lot of big time contracts and a lot of big time vendors that might not jive with what they're trying to do. The nice thing right now is one, anybody can build these things. Mm-hmm. So no, they don't say, Hey, specific organization, you can't build it. If they want to spend the time and effort, they can. Sadly, a lot of these companies are, they're large and they, mm-hmm. they can't be as nimble as a, uh, an innovation company who works on uh, what's called SBIRs or small business innovation research, which it has business size caps, all those kind of things. But re- the reality is it's, it's kind of that put up or shut up. Like yeah. we're moving in this direction, build us products that we can use or we're going to move on. And so right now it is a lot of this stuff is just enabling or enhancing 
the products we currently have, but someday that it, there is going to be a tipping point where the old products go the way of the dodo and either those companies keep, create the new product or realistically they're just going to buy these smaller companies yeah, and yeah. they're still going to be there. So my friends in a tech company, I used to work with quite a bit. They, uh, you know, always handed out buttons and stickers, innovate or die. Right. And part of it was yeah. you got to innovate to move forward. I totally get it in this space. Tell folks where they can find it. Right. Uh, because I'll tell you this much, man, if you're in that space, if you guys are listening and you want to get a sense as to what do these guys need, right. What, what, what would be the innovation that could help uh, sort of get back that tip of the spear you're talking about? It sounds like those are the conversations you're having. So point our listeners in the right direction to, to check it out and to get more info. Yeah. So the podcast is called uh, Kodiak Shack. Um, and then it's everywhere you can find podcasts. So, you know, Apple podcasts, we, we post it on everything. We're on YouTube. If you want to watch video, if that's your thing, yep. uh, we're you can check Instagram. out his amazing mustache. It's a top five that's like right. podcast mustache. <laughs> I've actually, uh, I've trimmed it up recently to, uh, to some people's chagrin and my wife is not excited that I still have it, but that's all right. Sure. You know, uh, but yeah, so we're on LinkedIn and we're on Instagram and YouTube and in all the places, uh, we try to post fun videos and stuff. Uh, but again, I'm the editor, so, uh, yeah. don't expect them to be too fun. Why so, do you guys but, call it the Kodiak shack podcast? <laughs> so that's the best part. So fire pilots just say ridiculous things. And, sure. um, so what we, we were in Misawa, Japan and we had these two lieutenants. So I was, a I was an older uh, flight lead. So I'd been there for about two years and they show up and, uh, and they're smart guys, crazy smart guys, but they, uh, for whatever reason. Um, so when you drop a bomb and if the bomb hits the exact spot you want it to hit, that is a shack. Okay. And so, um, so if you say, Hey, what is this? What is the answer to this question? And you answer it. Our weapons officer, who is the tactical leader of the squadron would say shack. And that's like, yes, nice. So, uh, so they would just run around the squadron yelling shack at random times. And then, uh, we go to Alaska because the best part about a fighter squadron is when you go somewhere, you go with your like 30 best friends. Right. And, uh, and it's great. So, uh, we go to Alaska and if anybody's been to Fairbanks, Alaska, you'll see the word Kodiak is there quite frequently. So then shack turned into Kodiak. Shack. They started saying Kodiak shack while you were there. And then yeah. sometimes it was just one of them would say Kodiak and then the other one across the room would yell shack. And so it's just as very common. Like, it was, yeah. it was part of everyone's like uh lexicon of like, Hey, we just say this thing. So when we were coming up with podcast names or trying to come up with something cool and we were like, it's just, just Kodiak. It's shack. right there. It's Kodiak yeah. shack. Nailed and it. it's fun to say. Yeah, yeah it is fun it. to That's say. That's right. I, yeah. it, it sounds great. My yeah. first, I was like, well, that sounds cool. I got to listen to that. That's a cool yeah. sound. Show. I don't even know what it's about. That's a great name. Yeah. Well, and then we've got so much latitude that we can talk about anything we want. We, uh, we'll do. You can talk uh, about called... fishing. You can talk about fighter pilot and stuff. Like you got exactly. a lot of, you got a lot of runway. Yeah, we do. We do what we call bro chats and it's where we'll just get a few fighter pilots. We'll sit down and we'll just talk. We'll do nice. our favorite thing. It's just talk about fighter things. So we'll Love cover it. innovation and we cover fighter stuff. So that's kind of what we enjoy and and we're having fun with it. I got a grizzled old three-star general that might come on. If, no pressure, but if you yeah. ever wanted to have an old dog on, I bet I you he actually, would. Uh, I, I bet you he'd be down to do it. I was doing my homework, and I saw he was at a. Uh, he was at Columbus. I saw that he yeah. uh, also. Uh, I looked on his LinkedIn, and my favorite part of his LinkedIn, which it, you can you know tell him if he if he hasn't seen this. Sure. But, uh, oh, he'll be listening. But yeah, he said uh, it said. Uh, his experience and it said none dot 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 i'm retired and i love that <laughs> yeah and he earned it too but he's yeah in, you he's him, enjoyed open, it Re retired in 2013 and he's enjoying every minute of it that's for sure yeah that's great well i have so many questions for him if he does want to hang out with a few uh few fighter pilots and tell some stories i'm sure we can make that happen yeah we'll see if awesome. we can get we'll see if we can get born to die <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's a wild man as you would expect oh i bet that would that would be a lot of fun we'd have good good time with that Brother, this has been an absolute blast. It's been great to get to know you, man, hear your story, right? Where you came from and how this all ended up and just the work you're doing, right? To innovate. I think it's really cool. We're grateful for what you've done on behalf of our nation, what you continue to do. And uh, you're welcome here anytime. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brian. I do appreciate it. And I appreciate all your listeners because, uh, you know, we, we obviously love doing our jobs in the military and stuff, but when people appreciate that we do it, yeah. it's just 10 times over. So You came to the right place for that, my friend. Well, thanks. The name of the podcast is the Kodiak Shack Podcast. He's Jeff 
Vader, Brandon. I'm Brian Jodis. That's been this episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast. <laughs>